This is the tallest room I've ever spoken in. It's kind of awesome. Hey, up there. Uh, I'm still on Seattle time. My body's still on Seattle time, so good morning. <laughs> all right, so all I do is sit around thinking digitally. So this is uh, a perfect talk for me. I don't actually do much. I sit and think digitally. It's kind of funny, if you think about it, that 70 years after the invention of the computer, we still have to have conferences with titles like think, uh, Thinking Digital, right? And this computer, for instance, the Apple One, 1977. It's almost as old as me, I'm 1974. So here's my sort of meta theory, since Herb put me on the spot to produce some meta thoughts. Thinking digital is not really about using computers more. It's about using clocks less. So that's my big theory. If that's the one thing you remember, that's what you take away from this talk. It's about using clocks less. So human beings have been shaped for several thousand years by the evolution of clocks, and especially the last 500 years with mechanical clocks that completely transformed our personality. And I want to give you three examples of how that relationship with clocks and time is changing yet again. First, television. This is an RCA 1933 television. And for about 70 years, we've had a standing appointment with this guy. Appointment TV, right? Our lives have become organized around television. And that has changed to binge watching or any other preferred form of on-demand television consumption, where instead of the television dictating your mood at a specific time, you use your mood to decide what to watch and kind of project your internal reality onto what you watch around you in your environment. Second example, the telephone. For about 100 years, we've been interrupting each other. This is what engineers call hard synchronized real time, right? We've been able to interrupt each other for 100 years and like most people under 50, I absolutely hate using the telephone for voice, and my wife and I mostly text each other. So we've gone from hard synchronized real time to what we call soft, uh, soft real time, soft synchronization. And finally, I'm assuming very few of you are wearing watches. We've gone from a century where the watch has been our primary temporal orientation device to a world where most of us don't wear a wristwatch and instead just glance at our phone screen and when we do, chances are it's not the clock number we look at but at some sort of alert. So yes, it's 10.57 on the screen but more importantly, it's time to work on the slides for this uh, conference. So putting that together, we're going from scheduled to on demand. We've gone from hard synchronization to soft synchronization and we've gone from a clock-based orientation in time to an event-based orientation in time. And this is the change, the transformation that I call going off the clock. And of course, if we are going off the clock, a good question is when did we get on it? So there's a long answer and a short answer. The long answer. Like a lot of things in Western culture, it begins with the Greeks, and the Greeks had two personifications of time. The guy on the left is Kronos. Kronos is linear objective time, and his symbol, as you can see, is the skite. This is where we get father time. This is where we get the association of time and death. And on the right, we have Kairos. Kairos is a subtler sense of time. It refers to the opportune moment to do something. When, the, when you say the time is right, you're referring to Kairos. And the symbol of Kairos is the scales, things being in the balance, risk and opportunity. So Kairos as the sense of time. So Kronos and Kairos have had a long history in Western culture. I'm not going through all of it, but uh, one chapter, for instance, was the philosophical divide between uh, Leibniz and Spinoza. There's a great book called The Courtier and the Heretic that uh, tracks the philosophical foundations they laid for Western culture. Another closer to our time is a debate on time between uh, Henri Bergson and Albert Einstein, which was very influential in the 1920s. But the one I want to get to is Virginia Woolf and A.G. Wells. Now, everybody knows that A.G. Wells invented one kind of time travel, right? The kind of travel you do in objective 
outside of your time. What you may not realize is that Virginia Woolf also invented a kind of time travel story, namely stream of consciousness, which is internal subjective time travel. And she has a very interesting short answer to when did we get on the clock? December 1910. This is a wonderful essay called Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown uh, tracing the foundations of stream of consciousness. But rather than explain what this means, I'll show you by example. So Mrs. Dalloway, the book that made Virginia Woolf famous, if you search the text, you will find 10 references to Big Ben. And the whole narrative is set up as streams of consciousness of the characters going about their daily lives, constantly getting interrupted by the ringing of Big Ben. <coughs> so Kronos constantly interrupting Kairos, external objective time interrupting internal subjective time. So, the way I interpret Virginia Woolf's uh, idea that human personality changed in 1910 and we got on the clock is we all kind of literally climbed inside a clock. So around 1910, we had clocks that kind of covered a city-sized area, right? So Big Ben can be heard in quite a wide, wide area. By 1918, we had continent-scale standard time. So railroad time had become standard time. So entire continents were living under the same time culture. By the 1930s, we had grid-synchronized electric clock time. This was an important move because we went from producing time in clock towers and you know, sundials to producing time in a central location and distributing it via a grid so that it was piped into your home like water or electricity. This was 1930s. And by the 1940s, we were distributing time over the oceans. This is LORAN an early uh, ocean navigation system that also distributed time synchronization signals. And finally, by the 1980s, we have GPS. So the time you look at on your phone, that comes from the local cell phone tower. The cell phone tower network is synchronized with reference to GPS satellites, and every GPS satellite, there are 32 of them in orbit right now, carries a rubidium atomic clock. So you could say that Virginia Woolf the trend she spotted in 1910, it's now come to its logical, technological peak perfection where we all live inside this cage of time made up of 32 satellites orbiting Earth with atomic clocks in them. But the interesting thing is, just as Kronos, linear objective external time, got to its peak of perfection, we started escaping from it. And I like to remember this whole story of the evolution of our relationship to time <laughs> with reference to the Roman god, this time Saturn, who is the Roman god of time. And you might know the story of uh, Saturn eating his children. So Saturn, it was prophesied that his children would kill him, so he decided to stop that by eating his children, except that the last one escaped and, well, defeated his father in battle and forced him to sort of regurgitate his siblings. And I like to think of Steve Jobs as Zeus and the clock as Saturn kind of eating human civilization and with the iPhone what Steve Jobs did was kind of like <laughs> force the clock to cough up civilization all over again. So we have kind of are returning to a pre-clock civilization. Okay, so going back to the 1920s when Virginia Woolf was inventing stream of consciousness to time travel and Einstein was debating Bergson, we have this obscure science fiction book that's good for, notable for one thing, which is this, what I think of as the best definition of time ever. And time is what keeps everything from happening at once. That definition uh, it was popularized by uh, physicist A.J. Wheeler. Uh, but this kind of gets at where the trend went after Virginia Woolf. And I think the person who really unpacked what happened next best is Ursula Le Guin. And if you like her fiction, you will notice that she does a lot with time and various cultures of time. But one of the most interesting things about her books is that she has this kind of sense of an indoors and an outdoors to time. So you have an indoors time, which kind of maps to subjective time, which is atemporal, cyclic, kind of permanent. And then you have this external landscape of time that's the landscape of history, irreversible events, destiny. So she meant this, obviously, in a poetic and philosophical way. But let's take her literally and look at space. So if you look at the history of how we've inhabited space over the last several thousand years, you spot something very interesting. 
Between the Great Pyramid of Giza, which was about uh, 2600 BC, to 1895, the Ulminster, which is a cathedral in Germany, the height of the tallest building built by humans increased only by 10%, 480 feet to 530 feet. But then suddenly, over just a century, the height of the tallest building went up five times. The Burj Khalifa is 2,700 feet high. And there's three reasons this happened. Reinforced concrete, electricity to drive elevators and electric light bulbs, and third, air conditioning. <coughs> so we kind of took control of how we inhabit space and vastly expanded the notion of what indoors means. Like this is a wonderful structure. We have three stories going up here and from the outside it's this huge thing, right? So we've taken control of how we inhabit space. Now, most of you are not wearing watches, but I'm sure you kind of roughly know what time it is, but I'm pretty sure that you only know you're at the Sage Gates head, but you don't know what latitude and longitude you're at. You kind of inhabit space on your own terms in these controlled environments. So that's what we've done to how we inhabit space. So the question I like to ask is, what is the reinforced concrete of time? What is the electricity and elevators and heating, ventilation, and air conditioning of time? And the answer, I like to think, is information. And the person who explored this the best is one of my other favorite science fiction writers, Philip K. Dick, who has this wonderful definition of reality as, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. And if you've read his books or watched any movies based on his books, you realize that his characters manage to get away from reality all the time, into dreamscapes and all sorts of other conditions. And the trick is, even though reality doesn't go away when you stop believing in it, you can go away. You can escape. And my favorite recent example of this is this guy. His name is Eric Hagerman. And the New York Times did a profile of him a couple of months ago. And this guy is a liberal who was so upset in 2016 when Trump won that he retreated to a pig farm in Ohio, cut himself from, off from all news, told his friends, don't talk to me about politics, don't talk to me about the news, and basically created his own reality by programming how information was coming at him. And you could say that he kind of forked off sometime in 2016, he froze, he hit pause on the mainstream of life and forked off in his own parallel universe. So that's what I think of as constructing your own reality. Constructing your own skyscrapers in time by manipulating how information fills your environment. And I think that's the world we are heading towards. We are heading, heading towards a multiverse of personal subjective realities, streams of consciousness. So we, we're coming from a world of Kronos where we all shared one big time culture and now we're all creating our own subjective information programmed realities that we're inhabiting. And it's kind of diverging out like this. I love this picture. It's, a, uh, I think, the Cook Inlet in Alaska. So that's what the world looks like now. And I like to think of this as going from a centralized Kronos culture to a diverging Kairos culture. And this multiverse of personal realities, I like to call it multi-temporality. But this takes a lot of imagination to do. If you want to create your own reality by crafting your information environment, that's a lot of imagination, imagination work. And if you fail, what happens is you end up inhabiting this other default condition, which uh, Bruce Sterling and William Gibson have written a lot about, called atemporality, where the future and the past kind of seem to mix together in this chaotic, disorienting soup it's very anxiety provoking, it's very stressful, you've heard a lot of people talk about it today. And atemporality, I think, is this transient condition between having a single unified clock culture <coughs> programming our lives to having to program our own realities, right? Binge watching on TV is an example of not doing it very well, where because the clock and schedule is not telling you when to watch TV, your alternative is to stay up night and day until you finish an entire season of a show. I've done that. Right? So that's what happens when atemporality takes over, but instead you can choose to start programming your own reality. Let me put the whole story together in this uh, big graphic. You've got this historical evolution of Kronos and Kairos. Kronos is the blue line, and over the course of a century, <coughs> it went from this world of sort of decentralized local time cultures which weren't really talking to each other, 
to this massive process of everybody kind of ending up in this cage of time of GPS satellites. The peak was around 1971. All those events happened and made Kronos kind of rule. And at the same time, Kairos, subjective stream of consciousness time, that went into a century long <coughs> recession, right? And now it's coming back. And the two transitions, the one Virginia Woolf noted in 1910, that was the first period of atemporality, and now we are going through another period of atemporality that's putting us into this world where we have to embrace multi-temporality and learn to program our own realities, <coughs> or we end up dying out of atemporality. So that's my meta talk on thinking digital. <coughs> Thank you for having me here, Herb.